Amen, 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 amen. While I got you standing, remain standing. I'm going to go right into the Word of God tonight. How y'all doing tonight? Y'all feeling good tonight? If you're feeling good, wave at me. Let, me. let me hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're online. I want to hear from you if God is blessing you tonight. We're going to the book of Genesis, chapter number 49, verse 5 through 7. Genesis chapter 49. I heard Pastor Vinchard, he already knows what, what the story is when I said Genesis 49. Glory to God. That's good. When I was young, I could remember like that too. <laughs> Genesis 49, 5 through 7, when you have it, say amen. Now, it's kind of unfair because in order to do this justice, I probably should have started at one and probably read the whole chapter. Jacob has, has come to the point in his life that he's getting ready to die. And he has gathered his sons around the bed to deliver unto them a patriarchal blessing. And you have to understand that in the culture in which this scripture is extrapolated, the patriarchal blessing is important. It could decree and declare which way your destiny was going to go. You understand what I'm saying? It, de it determined your birthright. It determined your destiny. To get the blessing of your father before he passed away was very important. After all, God has said that he was a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, so Jacob has coming, Jacob is at the end of the line as far as being identified as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob is about to die. It's the end of an era. It's the end of a, a, a patriarchal uh, dynasty. Uh, and, and the sons, the 12 sons have gathered around the bed. And two grandsons have gathered around the bed to get the blessing from Jacob before he departs. And he is dispensing that blessing. But when he comes to Simeon and Levi, it takes a turn. And it reads like this. Simeon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. O oh, my soul, come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly, mine honor, be not thou united. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they digged down a wall. Can you say amen? amen. Now, I'm going to teach tonight on a second chance at a blessing. A second chance at a blessing. Now, the scripture I just read didn't sound like much of a blessing. It was more of a curse. But if you've ever made a bad decision, <laughs> if you've ever done something that got you in trouble, and you needed a second chance at a blessing. Hopefully before the night is over, you will be ready to receive a fresh blessing. There is such a thing as a second chance at a blessing. Amen? Somebody say a second chance at a blessing. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we go into your word tonight, let our understanding be unlocked and open to receive the infallible word of God. We thank you for the treasure of your word and the power of your word. We thank you for the articulation of your word. We thank you, Lord, for the Bible. We thank you for everything that is written therein. We thank you that it helps us to understand the very strategies and doings of God. Continue to unlock that treasure for us tonight as we study the Word of God. We do so because we don't want to be illiterate spiritually. We want to have a deep understanding of who we are, what we believe, why we believe what we believe, and understand how to do this both spiritually and intelligently. I believe you to open up the windows of heaven and pour us out a blessing we will not have room enough to receive. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Somebody Everybody shout amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. Now, first of all, I want to start by saying uh, I want to make a distinction between the Word of God. The Bible said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it says, all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. 
In him was life, the light was, a, and the life was the light of men. The light shined in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. If the word was in the beginning, then the word existed before the Bible. Some people have reduced the word of God to just the Bible. But the word of God existed before there was anybody to write it down. The word of God deals with the character of God, the integrity of God, the promises of God, what God has said. God has said. Not what man has written, what God has said. And what we have before us is a recording of pieces of what God said down through history. And then we've had that recorded word of God, which we call the Bible, has been translated from ancient languages into contemporary languages. One of the first languages where the word of God, which was originally written in Hebrew, is now written in English, the Old Testament primarily in, the, in Hebrew, a little bit of Aramaic, but also in the New Testament, Aramaic and Greek, okay? And then it was translated eventually into English around 1611, actually, 1525, and then the authorized King James Version comes in 1600. This is way before that. <laughs> this is way before that. Now, the translations, we're going to talk a little bit about translations so that we can do this intelligently. You have to understand King James Version uh, was actually translated by a gentleman named William Tinsdale in about 1525. William Tinsdale translated the ancient scriptures into English and then King James made it the official King James version of the Bible, okay? And so when I came along, I didn't know any of that. All I knew is that the old folks taught us if it wasn't the King James version, it wasn't God. <laughs> We didn't, we didn't know where it came from. We didn't know where it started. We didn't know anything about it. That, and the only word of God for me is a King James Version. That's all they knew. So what we learn is limited to the level of the teacher that's teaching. <laughs> Come on, somebody. And so and, and some of the people who taught us early on couldn't even read. Okay, and in lieu of revelation or information, they came up with rules and regulations. You know, uh, you, you got to, it's holiness or hell and, 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 and don't wear makeup and don't wear earrings and don't wear, a lot of that was to fill in the blanks for not really being able to study the word as astutely as we can today. Now, as we look at these different translations, I'm going to show you different translations of the verse. I'm going to, and as I show you, I'm going, I want you to notice how the Word of God becomes clearer and clearer with each translation. And I want you to understand that the translation is not just written so that you can have a contemporary version because you don't like Old English. That's not just why it was done. The greater reason is as our understanding of the original language increases, we get a more clear translation of the word than we did at first, okay? It's not just that we're trying to take old King James uh, English and, and, and make it hip. It is that we are studying the word of God with more precision because we are living with more information than we ever had before. It's the same way with medicine. The way my grandmother treated a condition is a lot different from how my children treat a condition. Medicine has improved, and the doctors have said, oh, we don't do that anymore. In fact, you don't even have to go through that many generations. You can wait five or ten years, and the whole procedure changes. Because as you get more information, you become better at this. Are y'all following me? Y'all... I'm going to borrow Torre's uh, statement. Y'all tracking with me? <laughs> Did he kill us Sunday? Wasn't that amazing? Yeah. 
Yeah, so, so I'm gonna borrow from him tonight. I like that. Are y'all tracking with me, okay? So, so you read the first one, and now I'm gonna put it up in the NIV, and it'll give you a little clearer understanding because I really wanna dig into this. So it says, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are weapons of violence. Let me not enter into their council. Let me not join their assembly, for they have killed men in their anger and hamstrung oxen as they please. Okay, Let, let's, let's go further. Let's go to the American Standard Version and let's see if we can get a clearer vision of it. Oh, my soul, come not thou into their council unto their assembly, my glory, be, that, be not thou united. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they hocked an ox. Okay, let's go deeper. Let's go into the next translation, which is the Young's literal translation. Each one's gonna make it clear. Now, clarity does not take away from the substance of the text, but it makes it more understandable because we have better clarity as to the original intent of what he said. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The Bible said, in all thy getting, get an understanding. So the difference between preaching and teaching isn't whether I raise my voice or not. When I grew up, the difference between preaching and teaching was whether you could hoop or not. Oh, my God. <laughs> Hallelujah. They say, oh, he can preach. <laughs> and if you got up, you start talking like that, they say, he's a teacher, which was a nice way of saying you were boring. <laughs> you see, but the difference between preaching and teaching isn't the voice inflection. It is the depth to which you study and delve down into the word of God, irrespective of your voice articulation. Okay, so when we get into the little translation, into their secret come not, O oh my soul, unto their assembly be not united. Don't, don't hook up with these guys, O oh mine honor, for in their anger they slew a man and in their self-will eradicated a prince. Oh, wait a minute, I thought it was an ox. No, it's, it's a prince. In ancient times, they referred to princes as oxes because the burden of leadership rested upon them. So the more you begin to understand the difference in the terminology, it is not uh, a disagreement with that which was written before. It is that now we have a clearer understanding that the word translated there should have been prince and not an ox. And in the process of knowing that we're not just talking about an ox, and cutting loose the hamstring of an ox, that we're going deeper than that, we begin to understand that Jacob is still upset about what they did to Joseph. And even as he is dying, he's still angry about it. Can I go deeper? So as you can see from this, it can mean either uproot or to sever the hamstring in, in the hocks, it said the hocks, or back legs of a large four-legged animal. What he's really talking about, you've uprooted. You, you uprooted, you tore down. The King James Version says you tore down a wall. It seems that having decided that the Hebrew word means wall, the translator of the King James Version decided to render the Hebrew word in the sense of digging up the roots of a plant as opposed to uprooting the wall resulting in the, in the rather awkward, I mean, how do you uproot a wall? It's a poor translation, dig down a wall. What, what, what they were trying to do was to understand that he had uprooted something. He had uprooted something. And, and Jacob is talking to them as he's getting ready to pass away. And he says, I don't have a blessing for you because I'm, I'm still upset about what you did. Now, you know that Joseph is the beloved son of Jacob. He got the coat of many colors. He was favored by his father. They, uh, some Hebrew theologians suggest that Simeon and Levi, he, he's angry with them about two things. One, what they did to Joseph. And the other thing he's ang angry with them about is what they did to the men of Shechem. And I'm going to make that plain. I'm going to go into that. I'm going to make that clear. Because the Simeon and Levi got together, they was like bam and wham. 
when they got together, it was always some craziness going on. Now, any time they, the Hebrew uh, scholars suggest that it was Simeon and Levi primarily that led the deceitfulness that was bestowed upon Jacob in saying that Joseph was dead. So Joseph had lived all those years in pain, mourning over his son being dead, only to find out in his old age that his son was alive. And it's hard to figure out how to title this because I almost called it Family Matters. Because anybody, in, how many of you got a family? Uh -huh. If you got a family, you got some matters. <laughs> Yeah, and and this, is, this is a declaration that even though these, this is a family of God, even though these people are chosen by God, they still have some issues and some emotions and some feelings and some pain, and they, they're held together, but they're still not really together because Jacob is angry with them and he's upset with them, and even to his grave, he knows he's dying. He refuses to bless them because they have made him miserable. And when you study what they did, and we are going to study it in a minute, what they did with Donna, which was, uh, Donna was Jacob's daughter through Leah. And you begin to find out what happened to Donna when she ended up getting raped and what they did to the men and killed out a whole uh, group of men, a whole nation of men, utterly destroyed them deceitfully. Jacob is angry about that, the bloodshed, the loss, the deceit, the betrayal. Just like in your family, there's been some betrayals and there's been some hurts and you have to be a strong man of God and a strong woman of God to act like you don't know what you know. Come on, somebody. You, you know what I'm saying? That's why everybody's holiday is not a good holiday. Because when all them relatives come around, you got to act like you don't remember what you remember. Come on, we're we going to keep it real in here tonight. Yeah, and so they're all gathered around the bed, and they're all related, and they're all connected, but they're not really connected because the secrets get in the way of the connection. And Jacob is angry with them because he has endured much pain all of his life because of what they did. Now, and consequently, he has now embarrassed them in front of all of their brothers. Everybody else, just about everybody else, is getting blessings and promises. And this, the, a blessing is, it's hard to make you understand how important a blessing is. Jacob fought for, the, for his father's blessing. He wrestled in the womb for the blessing. He came out and, 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 and fought off Esau and, 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 and got his, his blessing for a bowl of soup. A blessing was a big deal. It was a big deal. Today in our Western culture, it becomes difficult to translate it. Actually, in the African, in many of the African cultures, it is easier to translate it because there's still a great deal of respect for a patriarchal blessing. In our Western culture, we just run off without anybody's blessing. We don't think that we need covering. We don't think that we need a blessing. We don't think we need permission. We, don't, we just kind of live our lives on our own, okay? So when we read this, we don't get the impact of what is being said here. In front of all of his brethren, now Simeon and Levi have to face the scorn of their dying father that is traumatic enough that I'm losing my father but in his last breath he curses me that means there's no more chance for me to fix this with him this is over it's done and I tell you something right now it is much better to have grief than guilt I'm gonna say that again it is much better to have grief then guilt. Grief is painful. I'm not underestimating. It's real painful. But, but guilt will make you try to pull mama out the casket. <laughs> come on, come on, come on. Uh, uh, it, it, it'll make you scream and holler and fall out and pass out in the floor because you, a, a lot of times when you realize you're never going to get it straight, you're never going to get it worked out, you're never going to get the love you should have got, you're never going to resolve the issue, you're never going to get over it, and now she's gone. Now we're screaming and we're hollering and we're chasing behind the casket. And We used to watch a movie, uh, you have to be a certain age to remember, Imitation of Life. 
Come on, talk to me, somebody. And the girl is running behind her mama, screaming and crying because, because see, dead people can't hear. That's why you ought to fix stuff while people are living. You ought to fix it while they're living because once they're gone, they can't hear you. They can't straighten things out. You ought to forgive them while they're living. You ought to straighten it out while they're living. You ought to get it together while they're living. You ought to pull it together while they're living so that you can get things straight. If you love somebody, tell them now. If you were wrong, say it now. If you need to repent, do it now. Don't wait till they're gone and then live with the guilt and the grief of losing the person. I don't know who needs that, but somebody needs that tonight, and I'm gonna give that to you for free. Thank you, Jesus. Sometimes you can make a decision in your haste, in your youth, in your selfishness, from your point of view, you felt justified to do it, but then in retrospect, as you mature and you get older, you look back at it, if you're fair and wise, and you see the other person's perspective, and all of a sudden you change your attitude because you get wiser about things. That's why y'all not write things in stone too early. You haven't lived long enough. You haven't seen enough. After a while, when it's your turn, things look different. One of the great joys about being a grandfather is that I get to watch my children try to do it. <laughs> and I just sit there like that. Uh -huh. Daddy, you won't believe what you did. I said, oh, yeah, I believe it. <laughs> yeah, I believe it. Do you, do you do, do us thou remember? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Wonder where she got that from. Wonder where that came from. Come on, talk to me, somebody. See, now, what we're looking at is decisions and consequences. I'm going to move you along. We're looking at decisions and consequences. These boys have made some decisions. They made it with Joseph. They made a decision because they were jealous. They made a decision because Jacob, had, Jacob really, to me, this is just my opinion, was not a great leader. Okay, he, 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 he didn't balance his, his love and, and he was very overt in letting the other brothers know that that's my favorite one right there. Well, what am I, Swiss cheese? Yeah, I'm gonna feel some kind of way about that. Yeah, I'm gonna feel some kind of way. And they got so besides themselves that they, they started hating him and decided to kill him. And then they threw him in a pit in lieu of killing him and then dipped his coat of many colors into blood and animal's blood and brought it up. And when Jacob starts talking about you digged it up by the root, you, you mess with the root of the family. You mess with the root, the promise, the future, the legacy, uh, the reason Jacob loved. There was, see, there was a reason why Jacob loved Joseph so much because Jacob loved his mother. Rachel, she was the love of his life and he had worked 14 years to get this woman and Joseph was the love child of their connection and every time he looked at Joseph, he saw his mama. And there they have dug up a wall. They have dug up a wall. They have uprooted him. They have destabilized him. They've broken him down. They put him in a situation. And, 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 and Jacob felt disrespected as a father. He, he felt betrayed. He felt deceived. Because all of this time, you told me he was dead. You lied to me for years. Now, there are people listening at me right now who can relate to this because you were lied to for years. For years you didn't know. You didn't know who your daddy was for years. For years you didn't know what happened. For years you didn't know what happened between grandma and grandma. For years you didn't know the real story. Sometimes they died and didn't tell you. And it's a hard thing when you've been lied to for years and it affects your heart and your self-esteem and your identity, and these decisions have consequences. I want you to write that down. Decisions have consequences. Decisions have consequences. It's not just about prayer and anointing yourself with oil. Decisions have consequences. Decisions have consequences. Elections have consequences. Marriage has consequences. You, you, you get married to prove to your parents, I'm grown and I can do what I want to do. That's good on the short side. On the long side, that decision is going to have consequences. You showed the parents a thing or two, but now you got to live with that thing or two. 
Come on, talk to me, somebody. Decisions have consequences. Just because you're saved doesn't mean that decisions don't have consequences. You can be saved and filled up with the Holy Ghost, but if you go out here and get on 30 and you start going 180 miles an hour, decisions have consequences. So when you get arrested, don't blame it on the devil. Because a lot of times we spiritualize things as being demonic that aren't de demonic at all. They are the consequences of decisions. And you can dance all over the church, but if you don't change your decisions, you can't change your consequences. You can fall out and be slain in the spirit, but if you go home and keep doing what you were doing before, your life is still going to be where it was. We can decree and declare a blessing all we want to, but if you don't learn how to budget your checkbook and balance your savings account and handle your finances, then, then all the, the blessing of Abraham is it, coming upon me. It ain't going to do you any good because whatever comes upon you is going to go to the ball. Oh, I'm going to kill your joy preaching like that. Yeah, decisions have consequences. That's why it, it's, it's good to be slow to make decisions. It's good to be slow to make decisions. It don't let nobody rush you into making a decision that you have to live with for the rest of your life. Jacob was disrespected as a father. His, his consequential patriarchal curse is a result of the pain he has. And you have to understand that about it. But I wonder, I wonder, could some of Jacob's dying wrath be fueled by his own guilt? Okay. First of all, and we're going to look at this, we're going to go to the scripture and we're going to look at this a little deeper in a minute. In the Torah, it clearly says that when those two boys, Simeon and Levi, went out and decided to bargain with the men of Shechem and tell them they needed to be circumcised, what they did is told the men of Shechem, you can have our sister and marry her if, you, if all the men in your country get circumcised. And they did it. Now, listen, brothers. <laughs> It probably ain't going to happen, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> if, if all of us have to get circumcised so that one of us, <laughs> that just don't seem like no good deal. Excuse us, sisters. We'll be back in a minute. But this is a brother's conversation. Just like y'all talk about having babies and stuff, brothers, talk back to me. I ain't about to do it, okay? You're going to live a lonely life, man, if I have to... Yeah, so all of the men got circumcised and while they were healing and hurting, they came in and killed them. God, now I don't have time to get into this part too deep, but God always hates people who take advantage of other people's weaknesses. This is, just, this, this is free. It's not going to cost you nothing, but I'm just going to throw it out here at you. The reason God hated the Amalekites is that the, Amalek, the Amalekites were known for coming in and taking advantage of other people's disadvantage. That's why later in the Bible, when David comes back and the Amalekites have taken all the women and children, they captured the weakest part, the people who couldn't fight back. They took them captive and God hated, the Bible said God remembered Amalek and God hated hated Amalek. Anytime you take advantage of somebody's weakness, God is always on the side of the oppressed. So while these men are sore and trying to recover, they came in and killed all of them. And Jacob had made a deal with, 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 with Dinah's boyfriend, he had made a deal. And these sons came along and deceived them and caused them to be killed. And Jacob never got over it. Now, but, 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 but the thing that stands out to me when I studied it closely, in the Torah it says, Jacob, it explicitly comes out and says that while they were doing it, Jacob said nothing. And though he didn't do it, is he not complicit? Is his silence 
part of the reason of his pain? Has he transferred his guilt into their hatred? Oh, y'all ain't talking to me now. Sometimes when you know you are complicit, you won't deal with your own complicity in the issue because you'd rather blame the other person than confront the fact that you didn't stand up like a man and speak up when you could have. And by the way, if, if, if Joseph was dead, why didn't you go down there and look for him? So while you're blaming them for killing Joseph, I don't read where you went to look for him as a man. You just accepted that he was dead. You didn't go see. You didn't ask for his body. You didn't have a burial. You didn't have a funeral. You didn't have a service. How in the world can you sit up there and blame Simeon and Levi for something that you weren't man enough to investigate? See, and, 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 and then, then while we're dealing with Jacob's reaction and the guilt of it, let us not forget that Jacob was deceitful first. And what he is cursing in Simeon and Levi, he was guilty of himself. He tricked Esau out of his birthright. He put on Esau's garment and deceived Isaac into getting his blessing. And he, he was always deceitful. His mama, Rebecca, was deceitful. Her uncle Laban was also deceitful. This is a generational... So, so what we're looking at tonight is how do you cancel a culture, now I know what it means in contemporary times, but I'm, I mean it this way. How do you cancel a culture that's running through your family? How, how do you break free of something that you can see that has been modeled in front of you, it's been demonstrated in front of you, your mama had too much, much mouth, your grandmama cusses everybody out, your Aunt Lucy barked away everybody and died by herself, and here you come, 17 years old, acting just like your family. There are certain things that have to be broken in your life, and if you don't break them off of your life, you will find yourself a victim of a culture that exists in your family. There's a culture in your family. There's a culture in your company. There's a culture in your workplace. There's a way things get done. There's a culture in a church. And every now and then there's a toxic culture. And if you're not careful, what was modeled in front of you, you become. Now, you become it, but you want mercy. But when I become it, you're ready to stone me. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, y'all see what I'm saying? So there are a lot of dynamics playing out here. I'm not excusing Simeon and Levi, but I'm saying they didn't get there by themselves. Jacob had been a con in front of them. And Rebecca, well, in fact, Jacob's name means trickster. So the old man who's laying there with the blessing, had, had, had the only reason he got the blessing was through deceit. And now he's looking at it in his son, and he's hating in his son what is a reflection of himself. Oh, my God. This is Bible study. Let, 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 let's study this. Sometimes you can hate in other people what you see in yourself. You won't judge it in you, but you'll kill it in me because you don't have the gall or the gumption or the strength to confront it in you. That's why you do it and God covers it. But when I do it, I need to be put out. These dynamics, the Bible comes to us that we might learn lessons about life as well as discover our relationship with God. It also affects our relationship with one another. Are you hearing what I'm saying? God is not just concerned about your relationship with him. The Bible said, how can you say that you love God whom you have not seen and hate your brother who you see every day? How can you praise God and cuss me? How can you say you love God and walk past me and not speak? 
that we only got two commandments, that we love the Lord thy God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul, and that you love your brother as you love yourself. Two commandments. Jesus said, if you get these two right, you got everything else right. If you learn to love God with all your heart, your mind, and soul, and if you love your brother as you love yourself, then all of the commandments are comprised in this one pill. You take this one pill, you got everything. It's a multifamily vitamin. You got C, you got vitamin D, you got vitamin E. You took one pill, you got all things. Jesus said these two, if you get these two things right, so you don't have to learn 10, you don't have to learn 20, you don't have to learn 12. He said if you just focus on loving God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul. And then he said, when it comes to other people, I'm measuring that too, that you love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you wouldn't do it to you, don't do it to me. Now, Jacob has forgotten what he did, but he has not forgotten nor forgiven what they did. Can we get into this? Yeah, let's get into it. Go to Genesis 34, 1 through 13. This is, this is where the plot thickens. If, first of all, Dinah, girl, if you'd have just stayed over there where you were supposed to stay, we never would have had this problem in the first place. So when the Bible brings it up, it says in, in verse 1, And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. Hold it right there. Go back. Hold it right there. Dinah, the daughter of Leah. Let's stop right there. Because first of all, her mama was wounded. <laughs> Her mama was hurting. Her mama was rejected. Her mama had never been loved. Her mama, she, well, her mama had to give up mandrakes to get Jacob to go in to her tent to go to bed with her. So, so this wandering daughter comes from a wounded mother. I'm gonna say that again. The wandering daughter comes from a wounded mother. So the Bible identifies Dinah as the daughter of Leah. That is no accident. The Bible doesn't waste words when it goes into letting you know Dinah, the daughter of Leah, not Bilhal, okay, not Rachel. It said, I want you to know that she is born from the tangle-eyed consolation prize that, that Laban tricked Jacob with. That was her mama. Now, the wounded woman produces a wandering child. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? It, and when you're in pain over your own, see, the whole reason she was in pain, every child she had, including Levi and Simeon, was an attempt to get Jacob to love her. Levi means joined. And she said, maybe now that I've given him another son, he will be joined unto me. Simeon hearing, and if he hears that I've had a son, maybe he'll love me. This wounded woman who never got to any peace until she had Judah. Because Judah means now will I praise the Lord. I have given up on Jacob. Now will I praise the Lord. She had finally turned to God and given to God what Jacob wasn't interested in. You can sit here and act like you don't know what I'm talking about. But this is Old Testament stuff. But it is current to what's going on in life right now. And sooner or later you come to a point that if I can't give it to him... I, Talk to me, somebody. The ages have changed, the clothes have changed, the, the skin tone has changed, but life is still life, and people are still people. And it don't matter what dispensation you're in, humanity is still humanity. This woman has been rejected all of her life. And by the way, what's wrong with me, Daddy, that you use me as a trick?
Dinah is the daughter of Leah. Leah was set up. She, her daddy gave her to him as a joke. So not only did she not have the love of a husband, she had never had the love of a father. Uh, can I go deeper? And it is difficult to know how to love a husband if you haven't had an opportunity to, to love a father. You don't understand men's ways, so you talk to a man like he's a woman and you read him like he's a woman, and you jump to conclusions like he's a woman, and it may not even be your fault. It may be your daddy's fault that he never was in the house in the first place, and you're guessing that man. But regardless, it'll make you wander. And so you end up with somebody <laughs> that, that, that does more damage to you already wounded because you are a wandering woman, born of a wounded woman, through the rejection of a father, and now you're wandering out there amongst these strange people talking about you looking for the daughters of the land. What are you doing, Dinah? You about to mess up wandering. Listen to me tonight in this Bible class. Stop wandering. Stop wandering from pillar to post, from here to there. Be still and know that God is God and wait on God to put it together and straighten it out. I know you've been hurt. I know you've been wounded. I know you've been ostracized and I know it wasn't your fault. But if you wander, Dinah, you're going to make it worse. Stand still. Still and see the salvation of the Lord. Stand still. I'm talking to somebody. Stand still. You've been running all your life. You're about to run into something you can't get out of. And God's got you logged on to this broadcast tonight to give you a warning to just stop running and be still. You run from job to job, from church to church, from man to man. You keep going because you're wounded and you learn how to handle your pain from your mama. Or perhaps your daddy. Regardless of where you got it from, it, it's handed to you. You don't speak English because you, taught, you were taught it in school. You speak English because they spoke it in your house. So you never had to learn English like somebody from another country would have to learn it because it was modeled in front of you. So it was easy for you to speak it. You might have had to learn how to write it, but it was easy for you to speak it because it's all mama spoke to you in. Want some more milk, baby? After a while, the baby say milk, 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 milk. Whatever is modeled in front of you is behavior that's easy to repeat. If mama gets mad and throws stuff, then you learn when you're angry, you should throw something or cuss them out or go into a rage or have a drink. So a lot of what, what becomes our behavior, we have adopted from the culture we are surrounded with. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, let me go home, which she bear unto Jacob. See, see, this is code. This is code. I can't get off it. I got to stay here. Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, is code. You have to know the story to understand what the writer is telling you. Went out to see the daughters of the land. It's bringing up everything I just taught. And when Shechem, the son of Hamer, the Habite, prince, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. If she would have stayed her hips where she was supposed to be, it wouldn't have happened in her. I know today you say, don't blame the victim. Yes, the victim is complicit. If you stay within boundaries, a lot of things won't happen. That does not absolve the guilt of the man in any way at all. What they did was horrendous and horrible and tragic and awful, but it is also a cautionary tale. You don't jump in everybody's car. You don't go to everybody's hotel room at three o'clock in the morning. I know it's not popular. Nobody's saying this kind of stuff. I know I'm gonna get a lot of hateful email, but it is true. We got to go back to raising our children. You stay within boundaries.
It's eight o'clock, go to bed. You get up in the morning, you brush your teeth. He don't bathe but once a week. What are you talking about? No boundaries has created this situation. The only thing about it is when Hamar saw her and raped her, the next verse, his soul clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. He fell in love with the girl he raped. Let that sink in for a minute. He fell in love with this strange Hebrew girl and maybe he, he saw her because she was strange. Cause, come on, fellas, you know how we like... <laughs> strange. It's not like there weren't any daughters of Shechem, but they were used to the daughters of Shechem. Here comes this Hebrew girl with an accent. She talks funny. She walks different. She's a different culture. And, and he raped her, fell in love with her. And his soul clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. And he loved the damsel and spake kindly unto the damsel. And Shechem spake unto his father. How you go back and tell your daddy you raped this girl? But anyway, he, he, and Shechem spake unto his father Hamor, saying, get me this damsel to wife. Okay. He doesn't ask her to marry him. He goes to his father because of patriarchal blessing. And he says, these are arranged marriages. Many, many cultures today still arrange marriages. The parents make the decision. And, and when he goes back to his father, he says, get me this daughter to wife. And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now his sons were with his cattle in the field, and Jacob held his peace until they were come. Come on. And Hamar, the father of Shechem, went out unto Jacob. Here the two fathers are coming together to have a conversation about their kids. Come on. And, and, the son of, and the sons of Jacob came out of the field when they heard it, and the men were grieved. They were mad. And they were wroth, which means anger with fire. So they were past mad. They were wroth. They were angry with fire. Because he had wrought folly in Israel in line with Jacob's daughter, they understood that God had already commanded them not to fool with people who were idolaters. And now he has defiled her, ruined her from the possibility of a Hebrew man because now she doesn't have any blood to ratify the covenant. Can, can I go there for a minute? She's given the blood to somebody with whom she has no covenant. Not because she wanted to, because he defiled her. That's what defile meant. That, the, the, let me explain this. In the Bible, on the night of your wedding, at the, at once the wedding, once the marriage is consummated, you would come out and wave the bloody sheets. And that was a part of the ceremony because marriage was not just a word covenant, it was a blood covenant. The whole purpose in the hymen in the body, the body works just as good with it as it does without it. But the purpose of the hymen in the body is to cut the covenant because the blood covenant is the strongest covenant possible. In, 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 in many religions, in many traditions, outside of, of Christianity and Judaism, it is still true, blood covenants are the strongest covenants possible. Now, she has lost her blood without her permission at, at the whim of Hamer. And Hamer communed with them, saying, the soul of my son, I mean, Shechem, went to his father, Hamer. And now Hamer is trying to work this out because the kid's in trouble. How many parents in here have had to work something out because the kids are in trouble? And when the kids are in trouble, you're in trouble. Whether you ask for it or not, now you're in trouble. Now Hamer goes down here to meet with Jacob to try to work this out. The soul of my son Shechem longeth for your daughter. I pray you give her him to wife and make ye marriages with us 
and give your daughters unto us and take our daughters unto you. And ye should dwell with us, and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade ye therein, and get you possessions therein. He said, we're willing to become one with you, and be connected with you, and become one people. And Shechem said unto her father, and unto her brethren, let me find grace in your eyes, and what ye shall get, and what ye shall get, ye shall say unto me, I will give. He said, whatever I have to do to calm you boys down, I'm willing to do it. I realize I messed up. Let's get this right. You just say what it's going to take to straighten it out. This is a family mess. And don't sit there and look at me like you ain't had no family mess. Because a family mess will keep you up all night. A family mess will have you walk on the floor at 3 o'clock in the morning. A family mess, you can't get out of it. You can't ignore it. You can't turn your back on it. You can't act like you don't care because you do care. And love will make you have to get in there and deal with somebody that you wouldn't have to deal with if it wasn't for the fact that your cousin went down at 7-Eleven and got himself into this situation. And now there you are. I know you said you weren't going to get him out of trouble, but there you are at 2 o'clock in the morning trying to get up some bells money and waking people up. Sit there and act like you don't know what I'm talking about. Trying to straighten out something. And now you're working overtime, trying to get some money to pay a lawyer to straighten out. <laughs> Ask me never so much dowry and gift, and I will give according as ye shall say unto me. But give me the damsel to wife. He says, whatever I have to do to fix this and make it right. I'm willing to do it. We can be one people. You can have part of our land. You can have our women. We can work together. You can, we can do business. We can interact together. And the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamer, his father, deceitfully. Wait a minute. This is where uh, our Hebrew scholars say Jacob said nothing. Why are the sons talking when the fathers are speaking? Oh, God. I could take off on that and go somewhere else. But, but okay. <laughs> and the sons of Jacob answered. They wouldn't even talk to you. Shechem and, and Hamer, his father, deceitfully and said, because he had defiled Dinah, their sister. Okay. Go back, go back, because I lost track of that in there. Go back, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back to the next verse before it. Go back to verse 11. Do we have it? And, she, and Shechem said unto her father and unto her brethren, let me find grace in your eyes, and what ye shall say unto me, I will give. I will do whatever I need to do to make this right. Okay? That's where we are. We got a problem. We got a problem because I'm going to take, take you to the next verse and show you where the problem is. Go down to verse 25. And it came to pass on the third day. So, so let me explain what happened. So the boys told them, they said, if you're circumcised, it'll straighten it out. Now, circumcision is a sign of the covenant. Same thing as the hymen is the blood of the woman. The cutting of the foreskin of the man meant I have a covenant with God. And what is happening here, everybody's breaking covenant. Everybody's breaking covenant. The rape was a break of a covenant. And now you've got these men who have no relationship with Jehovah getting circumcised and wasting their blood like she wasted her. You see how this is going down a hole? And, and, and so all of the men of Shechem who, who are going to be prominent throughout the scriptures, so I hope you really listen to this because the men of Shechem end up in so many stories throughout the Bible and you don't need to know the backstory that led to it. All the men of Shechem are sore. Now, let me say something to you ladies. If a grown man gets circumcised and, 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 it, and it's just three days, <laughs> sore is not a good translation. Sore and sorry <laughs> and swollen <laughs> and in pain unimaginable 
And it is into this environment that the two sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brethren, took each man his sword. There's the sword that Jacob is talking about on his deathbed and came upon the city boldly and slew all the males. Only one man raped her. They kill, y'all don't get it. They kill all the men in the country. And they slew Hammer, who did it, and Shechem, his father, and Shechem, his son, with the edge of the sword, and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went out. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and spoiled the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their sheep, their oxen, their asses, and that which was in the city and that which was in the field, they robbed them. They took all their wealth and all their children and their wives, took them captive and spoiled even all that was in the house. They wrecked the place. And Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, ye have troubled me to make me to stink among the inhabitants of the land among the Canaanites and the Perizzites, and I being few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me and slay me, and I shall be destroyed, I and my house. Jacob is scared. Jacob is scared that they have gotten into something that they can't get out of and that all the surrounding nations will rise up against him and kill him. But they didn't. So why is he still angry on his deathbed? He's still angry with. And they said, should he deal with our sister as with a harlot? And the scandal stops there. I want you to see the backstory behind Jacob now being old, laying in the bed, and he's still angry. Are you still angry? Jacob, who found the house of God and saw a ladder descend from heaven and saw angels ascend and descend, is still angry. J Jacob, who wrestled with an angel to the breaking of day, is still angry. Jacob, who found out his name was Israel and he was a prince and had prevailed with God. He prevailed with God, but he didn't prevail with his own temper. Are you dancing and angry, talking in tongues but still angry, laying hands on people but still angry? Jacob, you don't understand, Jacob got a blessing. He got a blessing from an angel, actually a theophonic manifestation of Christ in the Old Testament. He got the blessing, but he couldn't get rid of the burden of his own anger. And I'm teaching tonight, not just so that you will understand another Bible story, I'm teaching tonight so that you will see what unmanaged rage will do to your destiny. Now Levi and Simeon are cursed in front of their brethren. And they live with this curse. Now, the reason this is important is because each one of Jacob's sons represents a tribe. And now they can't inherit like they should inherit because they are living up under a curse and denied a blessing. You see how problems produce problems, produce problems, produce problems, and it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And now they're still up under the curse until Exodus 32, verse 23 through 30. Go right there. Exodus 32, verse 23 through 30. This is hundreds of years have passed. Hundreds of years have passed. No massive victory, no conquering, no massive success. In fact, the tribe of Simeon ultimately converged with other people and became part of the lost tribes, disappeared, untraceable, can't find them, not sustained. Simeon never got it back. 
not his descendants, not his children's children's children, not his children's children's children. Wait a minute. We're not in Genesis anymore. We're in Exodus. If we're in Exodus, exit us, exit us. Exodus is where us exits. If this is where us exits, we have been slaves for 400 years. And we have been in Egypt for 30 years, so we know at least 430 years have gone by. 430 years, are, am I born, y'all? 430 years is over 10 generations. And now they're coming out from captivity with Moses. And, and I'm, I'm going, oh, let me see how I'm doing. The time. Yeah, I'm good, okay. Yeah, okay. Now, and, and, and now they're coming out of captivity with Moses. And, and we're, we're about to see the breaking of a curse. And the reason I want you to see it is because it is possible. Touch your neighbor and say, it is possible. I want you to understand it is possible to get a second chance at a blessing. Yeah, yeah, type it on the line. It is possible to get a second chance at a blessing. Now, this is the situation. Moses has been in his own mess. He's been in his own mess. Isn't it amazing how God uses messed up people? Y'all ought to be shouting right now. You ought to be shouting right now. You know why? Because you messed up. <laughs> and, and isn't it amazing how God uses messed up people? What I love about Old Testament theology is that it shows us how messed up they were. And then in the New Testament comes along and says, these were men, of, we are men of like passions. With, that God can use people that are all messed up and their stories are all messed up and there are contradictions in their life and yet some kind of way God's purpose prevails over my pain. I'm going to say that again. God's purpose prevails over my pain. And if you're sitting there tonight and you've been in pain and you've been wounded and you've been ostracized and you've been raped and you've been overlooked and you've been cursed when you was expected to be blessed, that's not going to be how your story ends. Your latter day shall be greater than your former day. I speak to you right now in the name of Jesus that you have a God that is able to give you a second chance and a blessing. And if you would just take 10 seconds and praise him for a second chance. Yes, everybody grateful, everybody thankful, everybody appreciative. Thank God for a second chance. Thank God for amazing grace. Amazing grace. Thank God for a second chance. Thank God for a second start. Thank God for a new beginning. Thank God that God's purpose prevails over your pain. The purpose of God. He used harlots. He used hookers. He used street people. He used idolaters to accomplish his purpose. If God could use Ruth, if God could use Rahab, oh, y'all don't hear what I, if God could use Tamar, then God can use me. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. God used Rebecca. God used her in spite of her treachery. God still used her. And if there's somebody in here that wants God to use you, open your mouth and begin to give God the praise. Now, let's go deeper. I want to get something in. I want to get something in. I want to get something in. Oh, I feel this. 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 Somebody's about to get a second chance. This is a prophetic class. This is a prophetic class. This isn't just a Bible class. I thought this was going to be a Bible class. But this is a prophetic word. God is going to give you a second chance at a blessing. You've lived in guilt. You've walked in shame. God said, I'm going to give you a second chance at a blessing. That's why you had to be here tonight. That's why you had to be online right now. 
because God is about to open up a door and give you another opportunity to correct and break curses. He's going to turn it all the way around. He's going to spin it all the way around. God is about to turn some things in your life. Oh, wait a minute. Somebody help me praise him. I feel a yoke breaking. I feel a door opening. I feel a curse being released. I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Somebody shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Look at your neighbor and say, I will be triumphant. I will be triumphant. That's why I'm going to shout unto God with the voice of triumph. I might not look triumphant right now, but before it's all over, I will be triumphant. I will get it back. I will get a second chance. If I'm teaching what you need to be receiving, give him some glory. Online, give him a praise. Type of praise. Make a joyful noise. Make a joyful emoji. Make a joyful sentence. Shout unto God in this place. Okay, sit down, we gotta, we gotta go back to work. Now, whew. Now this is what has happened. Moses has been raised in the, in, with the Pharaoh in the palace for 40 years. He's raised up in finery. He's educated in a way he would have never been educated. He has a boldness that he never would have had in his mama's house as a slave. He's raised up amongst kings and leaders and he has a finesse and a strength because his environment was different. You see, his environment was different. And so, because God is raising him up to speak to kings. And he does not want Moses to end up walking up on Pharaoh talking about, yes, sir, boss. I sure is glad that you made time to, to see me. Uh, I, I got a word from the Lord for you. If you don't mind me telling you, uh, I am that I am sent me. Uh, no, he wants him to come boldly into it and say, I'm sent by God and I have a word from you. Thus saith the Lord God unto you. And some of you, God had to put you in a different situation so that you would have a different attitude. And that's why you don't fit in with your friends. And that's why you don't fit in with your family because God is raising you up for a divine purpose. You don't think like them. You don't act like them. You don't walk like them because you got a different destiny. My God, oh, let me stop. Mm. Woo. Who am I talking to? I'm talking to somebody tonight. Down through the years, God has been good to you. Now let me show you something because I'm gonna give you something. Sit down, sit down, sit down because you'll make me get happy. If I get happy, I won't get finished. Glory to God. How many are glad you came to Bible class? Now I want you to think about this. Moses spends 40 years in Pharaoh's house. Then he tries to execute his destiny off schedule and, and rises up and ends up killing an Egyptian and has to go on the run for 40 years in the desert. Now Moses is now in the desert with Jethro for 40 years. But that, and he's on, in the desert as an as a outlaw. And he stays there till Pharaoh dies. And a Pharaoh rises up that didn't know him. But even though he's an outcast from the palace, God has purpose in his pain. Because it's no accident that Moses has spent 40 years, he spent 40 years learning how to be a Pharaoh, now he spends 40 years learning how to survive in the desert because his destiny is tied to the desert. 
and he's going to end up leading the children of Israel through the desert. And the reason he could lead them through the desert is because he spent 40 years in the desert. When God is going to take you somewhere, he exposes you to the thing that's going to be yours before you get to it. Who am I talking to? And, and so Moses, could he, he's the only one that could have led them out of Egypt because he spent 40 years learning how to survive in the desert under the tutelage of Jethro, the Cushite, which means burnt face. So the burnt face Cushite man taught Moses, the Hebrew man, how to survive in a hot place. And all of a sudden, when Moses goes down there to tell Pharaoh to let my people go, he is releasing a people that he's kin to, but estranged from. They haven't seen Moses for 80 years. And now Moses is leading them away from the familiar into the unfamiliar. And they have seen the glorious power of God at the Red Sea, and they've had a moment of encouragement, but it was tough to get it because until Pharaoh drowned, they were scared to death and they wanted to go back, and rightfully so, because they don't know nothing about Moses. They don't know nothing about Moses. Now, Moses has got him through the Red Sea, and now he's gone up on the mountaintop, and he's gone a while. And while he's gone, they said this, verse 23, for they said unto me, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, that's right, for as for this Moses, See, that statement right there, I'm so glad you threw that back at me. As for this Moses, that you don't say that, this Moses, if you know the guy. If I say, as for this Robinson, that, don't mean, that means I don't know him. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we would not what is become of him. Moses is just some dude who brought them up out of the land of Egypt and he has no roots with them. And anytime you're trying to lead somebody that you are not rooted in, <laughs> it becomes difficult for trust to be sustained where there are no roots. And I said unto them, whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me, this is Aaron. Then I cast it into the fire, he lied, and there came out a calf. <laughs> That's like a seven-year-old lie. I, I, I don't know, I just walked past the kitchen and the kitchen door came open and the ice cream just jumped out the freezer, mama. That's the stupidest lie. They gave me the earrings, I threw it in the fire and the calf came out. Come on, dude. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And Levi said, oh my God, this is my chance. All the 12 tribes of Israel were gathered around and Moses just left it open and said, who is on the Lord's side? And Levi said, I'm going to jump in right here. And I came to tell somebody tonight, you can jump in right here. You don't hear what I'm saying to you. You've been cursed all your life. Let me stop. <laughs> You've been cursed all your life. You always had to take a back seat to everybody else. But God said, this is your chance. Who is on the Lord's side? Somebody holler, I am. Go back to my who is on the Lord's side scripture. 
And he said, who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of, come on, that's right. All the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. They said, we're on the Lord's side. And they said unto him, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, put every man his sword by his side and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor. And wait a minute. They reversed the curse with the same thing that brought the curse in the first place. Y'all don't want to talk to me. 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 God's going to take what was working against you and turn it around and let it work for you. Who am I talking to tonight? And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. For Moses has said, consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that ye may bestow, that he may bestow upon you a... Y'all don't hear this word. Y'all don't hear this word. God bestowed on them a blessing that they couldn't get from their father, that they couldn't get from their mother, that they couldn't get from their brethren, that they couldn't get in captivity, that they couldn't get from Pharaoh, but God has decided to bless you. Type on the line, God has decided to bless me. Said to your neighbor, God has decided to bless me. Tell your other neighbor, God has decided to bless me. Tell your haters, God has decided to bless me. Tell your neighbors, God has decided to bless me. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, ye have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. And that was how they broke the curse. Now, this is what I want you to get, and I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. Okay. I'm going to show you this. <laughs> she said, oh. <laughs> Moses' problem is that he's leading a people with whom he's not been rooted. And every, when there is no root, every time you leave, they doubt you. When there is no root in the relationship, every time you step aside, they doubt you. And you say they're needy. They're not needy, they're doubtful. They're doubtful because there is no root. And you are in a position for which there is no root. That's true. That's true. Now, you came back into the boy's life and he's 30. And you want to pick up where you left off. It's not that he hates you, there's no root. You got to build a root system. You remember when they said that 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 Levi and Simeon had 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 digged up a wall, and then we then the next translation came along and said that he had uprooted. You remember that? It said he had uprooted. See, when you are not connected to who you're trying to lead, you uproot things, and a rooting system is important in order for there to be fruit. And some of you are trying to get fruit out of a relationship where you have no root. So Moses had no root with them, so every time he left, they wanted to leave. We don't know what has become of this man called Moses. Let us make us some gods and go back to something that we have roots to. No root in the relationship. No root in ministry. You're trying to lead people that you're not rooted to. If, you're not, if there's no rooting system, if, if there's no rooting system, if you can't talk to a crowd like this, you can't talk to the stadium. 
People who've been in this church a long time know that I taught for years and years and years every Wednesday night. And we would have thousands of people in here every Wednesday night because I knew that you cannot just lead a church from Sunday morning. You have to root it on Wednesday. See, right now, you know what I'm doing? I'm digging amongst the roots. I'm digging amongst the roots. Yeah, yeah, Sunday morning, I'm going to talk to the branches and the fruit and the leaves and everything else. Wednesday night, I'm digging amongst the roots. And I, if you're listening at me right now, you need a rooting system. You need to build a rooting system. Your marriage isn't over, you just need a rooting system. Your career isn't over, you just need a rooting system. You're an entrepreneur, you need a rooting system. You can't be uprooted, and then every time you move away, they leave, you get mad, you can't figure out why they left. They left because they don't know you. They don't have your spirit. They don't have, they don't know your voice. My sheep know my voice. A stranger they will not follow. In order for your sheep to know your voice, you have to stick around long enough for them to have some roots. You need roots in your marriage. You need roots in your family. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? I'm gonna give you one more scripture and I'm gonna close. Can I, can I give you one more scripture? Go to the Gospel of St. Mark chapter four, verse one through nine, and I'll be done. This is good. Is this good? I thought it was good. It was good when I got it. Yeah, it was good when I got it. Mark chapter 4, verse 1. This is important because this is what Jesus is teaching. And all of this is ultimately tied back to this blessing. Why you get it or don't get it really comes down to how you're rooted. That's why the Bible said, be ye steadfast unmovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord because in order to be rooted you got to be stable you got to get someplace and stick you got to stick it out when it's good and stick it out when it's bad and stick it out when it's working and stick it out when it's not working because even when it's not working on the surface it's working underground oh my god I help somebody. I don't know who it is, but I help somebody. You up there looking for leaves and stuff, but let me tell you something. Bad weather will kill all the leaves and all the branches, but if it don't kill the roots, it's going to come back up again. You're trying to produce fruit so you can put it on Instagram. Don't worry about putting fruit on Instagram. Put roots underground. If you put roots underground, the fruit's going to take care of itself. Listen to Jesus teaching, fourth chapter, Gospel of St. Mark. And he began to teach by the seaside. And there was, a gra there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into the ship and sat in the sea. And the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. Jesus sitting in the boat teaching. And he taught them many things by parables and said unto them in his doctrine, hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. And the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth. And immediately it sprang up because it had a little bit of earth because it had no depth of earth. Come on. But when the sun was up, it was scorched. And because it had no root and because it had no root and because it had no root, it withered away. This time, if you're going to win, you're going to have to be rooted. I'm telling you, the battle you lost before, you can win now if you get the rooting system in place. You didn't lose it because the seed was bad. You didn't lose it because God didn't love you. You didn't lose it because the devil had more power. You lost it because you didn't have no root. And some fell amongst thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it out, and it yielded no fruit. Come on. And others fell on good ground and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some 30, some 60, and some a hundredfold. And he said unto them, He that hath, let him what the Spirit is saying. That's what God wants you to know. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Okay? Let me do this. I'm going to take, sit down for a minute. I'm going to take, I'm going I'm to I'm follow chorus lead. Pastor Quirk did something last week. I'm going I'm to do it this week. Yeah, I know. I know. I saw it. I was watching too. I was watching too. She taught on the names of God, didn't she? 
Yeah, so what she did, somebody get a, a, a mic. Some, what she did, I'm gonna do it too for about 10 minutes. Uh, and you, you that's online, if you get a good question online, uh, you all send it to me. I'll answer a couple of questions online. I'm gonna take about 10 minutes. Who's got the first question? Okay, where's the mic? Where's the mic? I asked for the mic. Somebody ought to be moving with the mic. Yeah, thank you. She's coming. She's coming. She's coming. I'm excited. Calm down. Okay. Yeah. I have everybody running. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. Yes. How do we build a rooting system? How do we what? How do we build a rooting system? You're teaching we need a rooting system, R O O T I N G. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How do we build that? In what area? Is, are we talking about families or business or? Family, business, personal relationships, just kind of. Does it depend? No, you, you, each one, the answer is different to every question. Okay. Like for a lot, a lot of times in business, our businesses don't succeed because we go for the glam and we don't have the infrastructure. Okay. So you want to build an infrastructure. Yes. And if, if you only got limited resources, you want to put it in the legal infrastructure of the business yes. more than the glam. Okay. There, there are delis that are open in New York that still have the furniture they had 100 years ago, and they're still open. And if we owned it, we would have redecorated it and blinged it out and put and chandeliers it. in it, and, and they put it in the profit, and they, yeah. they have a rooting system. So in a person... In, in, a, in, a, in a personal relationship. Yes, I'm coming, I'm coming. I'm going to get there, too. Thank in a personal you. relationship, the rooting system has to be built deep by not making demands okay. before you're in demand. Okay. See, see, we go in making demands of people that we don't have enough demand to make demands. And so you want to build a rooting system of stability, of loyalty, of connectivity, yes, of understanding and transparency. All of that is your underground work that has to be built. So you know why? So when something goes wrong, you have something to hold on to. You, you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so for example, you can go through midlife crisis. I can go through midlife crisis. You can go through menopause. We can withstand it if we had roots. We, we, I, I, can, I can love you now over who you used to be. Come on. Yeah. And I know you would do different if you could. Yes. But if there's no, if I marry you in the middle of the crisis, then I don't have enough roots to have anything to hold on to right. to stabilize me in the storm. So would you say compatibility? Compatibility a is a part of it, but, but, but longevity is better. See, see, longevity is better because trust takes time. We are never commanded to trust another person. We are commanded to forgive them, but we're not commanded to trust them because trust is not something I can make myself do. I can make myself forgive you, but I can't make myself trust you. You can make me trust you by consistency. If you just be consistent, if you just be there long enough, eventually trust is going to be a, a result of your consistency. Consistency is important, and you have to build a rooting system. You have to build a rooting system by being there when I'm in trouble, being there when I'm in a crisis, and you have to build a rooting system, not only by giving love, because I can already see people typing on the line, though I can't see it. I can see them say, I did all that, and it still fell apart. Not only is it important that you give it, but that you find somebody who can receive it and reciprocate it. Because it has to be mutual. It has to be mutual, it can't be one-sided. This is not witchcraft. You can't make me love you. You see, it, it, and some of you have made good investments in bad ground, okay? So the first thing in a relationship you want to know from a companion, you, and you can't just ask them this, you have to observe this. Are you safe to love? Are you safe to love? And, and one of the ways you can observe it is watching how they handle other people they say they love. 
If you've divorced everybody that came into your life and you can't get along with nobody else in your life, what in the world would make me think that I'm going to be the one exception in your life that's going to beat the odds? The best predictor of future behavior is past practice. If you see somebody who has had several long-standing, loyal relationships that continued over a period of time, you begin to understand it is within your ability to be loyal. Some people don't have the ability to be loyal, and Jesus said, in essence, you are casting your pearls before the swine. I'll, I'll take two more. Here's a question from online. How do I block out other voices and focus on God's voice? That's a good question. That's, that's a good question. One of the things, and, and I, 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 could, oh, I, I could spend a long time on this. One of the reasons we have worship services is to feed your spiritual ears to hear. We have spirit, just like we have five senses in the flesh, we have five senses in the spirit. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. That doesn't mean he that hath a physical ear. That's everybody. That means somebody who has an ability to hear what the Spirit is saying. How do I get my spiritual ear exercised? By worship. Because worship makes you practice communicating with somebody you cannot see with your natural eye nor hear with your natural ear. And as that relationship becomes strong, prayer does it, worship does it, communication with God does it until he becomes more and more voluminous in your life. But you can't watch TV all day, scroll through Facebook, interact with friends, listen at crazy music all day, and expect to hear God's voice. If you want to hear God's voice louder than other voices, spend more time with God. Get a rooting system with God. Let's get you on a prayer diet. Let's get you on a prayer diet. Let's get you on a worship pattern where every day, I know you're busy. If you don't do it, but when you're in the shower, let's make that time God's time. While you're driving to work, cut off the music and start communing with God until it becomes something that becomes routine to you and then God's voice will be louder. The other voices will always be there because God intends for there to be a trial in your Garden of Eden. If, if, if you kill the other voices, then you don't choose him. So, so it's not about killing the other voices, it's about calming them down so that you can say, God, I hear them, but I prefer you. I, I'll take another, am I helping somebody? How long did it take for the descendants of Levi to be blessed again? We know it had to be at least 400 and some years before, before, because they went into idolatry. They went into Egypt and they started seeking other gods. It's not that it took God 400 years to do it, but they had turned away from God. And this is why they had become uh, enslaved by the Egyptians and they took on the ways of the Egyptians. And so God had to separate them from the environment that had infected them to purify them in the wilderness. The Bible said he proved them in the wilderness. So the word prove is to test. He's pruning them. He, he, he's untangling their roots from their, they had become so much like the Egyptians that when they got ready to build a God, they built the Egyptian God as an image. You become who you hang around. Okay, and that's why it took so long. So there is no specific length of time. It's how fast do you turn? God said, if you return unto me, I will return unto you and I shall be your God and ye shall be my people. So it's not how long does it take God to do it? It's how long does it take you to do it? Yes. Next question, I'll take one more question. How do you truly surrender? I am literally the willing vessel. I'm the spiritual curse breaker. I am the one. 
And I always got blamed for things when I was young because I didn't know certain things. I didn't have that model before me. And so now, in the last past couple of years, it feels like I get all the backlash. I get all the rejection. And I've been independent for a while, but there get times where I need help. And I'm just tired of having to be the strong friend all the time. I pour into people every single day, even when I'm empty. And I know that some people say you can't pour from an empty cup. It's just in me to pour into people, no matter of my circumstance. I've put myself in places, um, you know, where I aspire to be. I invest in myself, even when I can't even finish paying my bills. Like, I believe. But how do you truly, and that's, I guess it's the second question, but how do you truly keep believing when your own family really just don't believe in you? They see you for who you are now, but not who you are becoming. You don't need them to believe it. You don't, you don't need them to believe it. You, you really, a prophet is without honor in his own country. And it's not unusual for the people closest to you to not see you in that light because that's not the relationship that they have with you. The relationship that they have with you has nothing to do with your destiny. It has something to do with your history and their connection to you is as a family member, not a vision supporter. So stop going to people who don't see it, trying to get support from them. I'm not saying leave them alone, still love them as a family member, but don't connect your spiritual destiny to somebody who is just a family member. And, and, and I hear pain in your voice. Yeah, I hear pain in your voice. And there's two things I wanna say to you. Oh, glory. There's, there's two things I, I wanna say to you. The reason everybody uses you up is because you draw people who need you and not people who feed you. When you get in a room with people who can feed you, you don't feel worthy of being in the room that you're in. So you find yourself gravitating toward people who need you because then you can lead them, but they leech off of you, okay? So what I'm saying to you, what I want you to do is to go into rooms where people are above you and resist the temptation to run until you own the new you on the inside. You're trying to get everybody else to believe something about you that you're struggling to believe about yourself. And you're hurting for support because you need reinforcement because the voice on the inside says you're not worthy of what you're believing God to do. And I want you to receive this for yourself because I believe I can help you. I believe I can help you. I believe I can help you. If you listen to what I'm telling you, it will really, really help you. You're going to go into the room and you're going to feel unworthy and you're going to feel uncomfortable and you're going to feel incapable and you're going to feel scared. Stay anyway. Stay there. The only reason you feel uncomfortable, unworthy, is not because you're not worthy of it. It's because you haven't rooted yet. If you stay in the room long enough, it will become your norm and you will have a rooting system to support you. Instead, you're trying to root with your family and not with your destiny. You don't have to try to root with your family because your family is supposed to love you for who you are, not what you have, not what you drive, not how many degrees you have. They're supposed to love you because, just because you are, okay? We should never prostitute our family where we make our relationship with them predicated on their performance. You don't have to earn my love to be my child. I'm going to love you anyway. I can't help it. I'm going to love you if you're a drug dealer. I might be hurt, but I'm going to love you if you're a drug dealer because you're my child, okay? That's a whole different relationship.
I am not the supporting system necessarily that's going to take you into your destiny. I am the supporting system that got you here. What got you here may not be what takes you there. You understand? You, you see that? You see it, don't you? Okay, now watch this. The way you see yourself makes certain types of people drawn to you. And they are drawn to you because they are reflecting how you see you. Okay? Now, I'm not saying get rid of all of those people who need you. Because there's a certain degree of gratification you get out of serving and helping and doing all that. I'm saying to irrigate your desert and put streams in your desert by streaming water into those dry places. The reason you are drying out is that you don't have no water coming into your desert. And that water is going to come from other places. But the funny thing about the water, when it comes, you're going to be scared to drink it. Be because it's unfamiliar. And you're a little bit scared of it. And so you go back and get more people who need you. And then you're empty and you're draining. You say, I keep pouring out and I keep pouring out. And you say, they say you can't pour out, but I can. There, there's nothing wrong with pouring out if you're taking in. So I want you to be intentional. Here's your homework. I want you to write down all the people in your life who need you. And then I want you to write down all the people in your life who feed you. And I want you to notice how short the list is of the people who feed you versus the people who need you. And I want you to, here's your homework, is to lengthen that list of people who feed you. And it doesn't always mean that you have to be in their face. It can come through podcasts. It can come through going to operas and plays. It can come through going to places off the beaten path where you have never been before and wouldn't think to go. You should go. And you should go and you should meet people and you should make friends until you become comfortable in the conversation in places where you've never been before. Okay? I want you to remodel your life, your wardrobe, your appearance, your vernacular, your tone, your temperament to where you're going, not where you've been. When you go back into the areas where you've been, you can always speak that language. You know that language. You didn't have to learn that language. You know how to speak that language. But I want you to adopt the language of your destiny and not just your history. And this is going to take time. Here's the good news. It can start in church. You know why? In a, in, a, in a church like this, there's all kind of people. There's people from the shelter. There's people that are homeless. There are people that are entrepreneurs. There are people who are coming up from the shelter going to be entrepreneurs. There are people with degrees. There are people with doctorates. There are people who can't read. In a, in a church, there are all kinds of people. You get to choose where you sit. You get to choose who you connect with. You get to choose who you go to eat with and, and get in some small circles. If it's one or two people, it don't need to be 20. Just one or two people that are going in the direction you're going and hop in the car. Hop in the car, go along for the ride. Get, get into something that is positive. And, and I'm, I'm gonna go a little bit deeper because I think I'm talking to you and I'm talking through you. Uh, get into an environment of people uh, who feel who, who, who feel what, whatever it is that you're trying to be. If it's artsy, go, go, go to art shows. You're an entrepreneur. Okay. Okay, give her the mic back so they can hear. Yes, so I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I actually did network marketing starting in 2020 of mm -hmm. a health and wellness franchise. Um, I'm a life coach getting my life together, but I have been able to just grow in different aspects. I do credit repair as well, and I just, I just became a member not too long ago, and I love you because you are just so unorthodox. And I feel like <laughs> I, if I want to go be a doctor tomorrow and I want to be, be a photographer the next day, then that's what you could do. Yeah. God has placed so many gifts in me that is like, 
so amazing, you know? And I struggle sometimes with that because I need to figure out how can I impact people through what God has blessed me, but also how can I, how can it be sustainable? So you're a life coach and, what, and you're an entrepreneur. Is that the entrepreneur part? What, what else do you yeah, do? Yes, so credit repair and a health and wellness franchise. Okay, everything you're doing is fixing people. Right, right. Okay, Right. that's telling me something. That, that's, that, that lines up with the profile. What you chose to go into is what you're complaining about. Because uh, uh, if you're a health and wellness coach and if you're a credit repair person, you're, you, you're, you're, you're making your money from people who need you. I want you to pick something, don't have to give that up, but I want you to pick something that feeds you to balance that out. Okay, to, to balance that out, to balance that out. I don't hear you talking about uh, being connected with groups of people that, that feed you, that, 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 that you can be a little girl in the room. So, yes, so when I say I've been investing in myself, I have literally been putting my, like, Two weeks ago, I went to Atlanta for um, a mastermind, mm -hmm. Neil's mastermind, and literally just uncomfortable. My last two years of my life have been uncomfortable. Two years ago, I was homeless. I lived in California, grew up in Compton on Proveru Street, mm -hmm. and literally took a step of faith and moved here about almost two years ago. So it's a long story, and I don't want to hold you. Hold up. Let me tell you something yes, sir. that you are not getting. You are doing good. You are doing good. You are doing good. I want that to break through the wall that you have built in front of yourself. You don't clap for you. You need to clap for you. You need to celebrate you. If you were homeless, you grew up in Compton, and now you're doing all of that stuff, you are doing much better than you are feeling. Your emotions are still homeless. Your emotions have not caught up with where you're at yet. And I wanna bring your emotions into where you are right now. You are doing good. You deserve to be here. You belong here. You're in the place you're supposed to be. Your emotions eventually will get the memo. They don't get the memo at first because they're still carrying the scars from all the things you said and didn't say that happened to you in your life. Your emotions are still back there. And, and we're gonna bring them up here by celebrating where you are right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and I don't know what your financial level is now, but when your financial level gets strong enough, I want you to get therapy. at T.D. Jake's ministry. Good, good. I'm trying. Good, yeah. good. Get the therapy. And the reason you get the therapy is not to say you're crazy. No. It's not to say anything. I need to move on. Yeah, yeah. Yes. You, you need to move on. Yeah. Your emotions need to come out of that. You know why? You've been traumatized. I have. You've been traumatized. And the reason you don't clap for yourself is the walls that you built to keep the pain out also won't let the love in. Okay, so, so you build the wall to protect yourself, to survive the vicissitudes of life. The problem with the wall is now nothing comes in. Okay, nothing comes in. And you don't know how to tear down your own wall. Therapy helps you to brick by brick tear down the wall so that you can receive the sunlight on the other side. The wolves are gone. But the sunlight can't get in. Love can't get in. And the clapping doesn't come from another person if it doesn't come from you. Okay? So, so that's a process that's going to take time. That's going to take going back to the trauma. And let's see how deep it is and how bad it is. And, and why you can't cough that up and get that out. And get you on wellness so that your emotions can catch up with where you are now. 
You got it? Clap your hands, give God a praise. How many people got something out of that? Yeah. If you're watching online, you stayed online all this time, I must be speaking your language. I spoke something tonight that I pray touches your heart, touches your soul, touches your spirit, and changes your life. I'm so glad that you chose to watch tonight the Potter's House here in Dallas so I could teach you a second chance at a blessing. You do have a second chance at a blessing. My sister had a second chance at a blessing. You can have a second chance at a blessing. You can have a second chance at a blessing. You can have a second chance at a blessing. You can have a second chance at a blessing. You can have a second chance at a blessing. You can have a second chance at a blessing. Everybody rise. I'm going to close. My Father and my God, as I stand here tonight, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your word being sure and being absolute. I thank you for what we learned tonight about your word, what we learned, Lord, what we learned about Jacob, what we learned about Levi, what we learned about Simeon, what we learned about Moses, most importantly, what we learned about you, and lastly, what we learned about ourselves. I pray, God, that we go home better than we were when we came in and that the Word of God would dwell in our hearts richly by faith. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Go in peace. Love you.